Hola, buenas tardes. Good evening. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. En Casa con la Plaza is, of course, our three times weekly series of sessions from our home to yours, presentations, conversations, performances, and demonstrations that uh, we started back in April of 2020 during the early days of the pandemic. Now that we're easing out, we're continuing with these programs because we want to. All right, so if you're on Zoom, please welcome. Use the chat feature to let us know where you're viewing from. If you're on Facebook, do the same thing. We have the comment section, let us know where you're viewing from. You could ask questions, use the Q&A feature on Zoom if you'd like. Here is Peter Anderson, just, uh, he's coming in from Tucson. Uh, let's see, let us know, uh, ask questions, make comments, shout outs, whatever. All right, we welcome that. But before we get started, a couple things. Uh, our sponsor for today is One Legacy. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving lives through organ, eye and tissue donation in seven counties in Southern California, LA, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and Kern County. Please support One Legacy. Also, a little bit of update, what's going on at La Plaza. We're open Wednesday through Tuesday, closed to, to Wednesday through Mondays, closed on Tuesdays from noon to 5 p.m. La Tienda gift store is also open. All of our exhibitions are open, including LA Starts Here, Calle Principal, our Afro Latinidad, Mi Casa, My City, Carlos Almaraz. And Only Light Can Do That, which is a neon art installation by Patrick Martinez. You don't even have to come into the museum to check out our exhibitions. Just uh, cruise by on Main Street. Our public programming has also begun. You could, uh, music, dancing, family days. Go to La Plaza, pick up one of these nice little brochures so you could plan out the rest of the year with some fun stuff. And finally, want to let you know about our 10th Annual Pobladores Awards Gala. We're celebrating our 10th year at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, and we're going to have some incredible uh, awards given out to our funders, our founders. That's going to be on September 29th. So you could get all that information at lapca.org as well as on our Facebook page. So with that, Today's happy hour, Wednesday, I mean, on Friday nights, every other Friday we have with us the fabulous Dan Guerrero. Please join us, Dan. Hello. I can't believe it's been 10 years, no way. Oh yeah, you've been there since the beginning. I know, I know that you, uh, in fact, right there at LA Starts Here, there's a, a wonderful display of, uh, of somebody that you knew very well. Your father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It opened with, and in fact, uh, they're revamping it and and uh, expanding it uh, on my dad, Lalo. Um, and also, I did, I think, some of those interviews. They were doing oral histories, and I don't know. And all I know is giving Gloria Molina a big kiss on opening night, and that seems like three years ago, max. I can't believe it's been 10 years. Maybe where, that's where why you, I'm so old. Well, you're going to have to join us on September 29th so you could give her another big kiss. Sounds like a plan. I, I, she, you're honoring her because you're honoring all the founders, right? Yes. Aren't you honoring the founders? We certainly are. And she's, Including uh, Bell she's, Hernandez. She's, Isn't Bell yeah. Hernandez involved that night too? She's getting, being honored everywhere these days. <laughs> um, anyway, I was going to ask you a question, but it went out of my head. So it couldn't have been very important. So I think you should just go away. <laughs> and let me and I will. Tonight's guest. Okay? Okay, we'll see you later. Again. <laughs> Thank you. Those things happen, don't you know? Um, anyway, I'm very excited about tonight's guest. He's in, you know, one of those enviable actors who moves easily from uh, the big screen to television to the stage, uh, never mind directing, writing, producing. Um, he's a kind of uh, Chicano Orson Welles, but thinner. Um, he's currently, as a matter of fact, co-directing and co-producing Uh, well, actually, he, he, they're, they're still working on it, a documentary on Los Changuitos Feos de Tucson. And if you've never heard of them, shame on you. And uh, it's a fascinating story, and you'll hear all about it. And uh, we're being joined by Steve Carrillo, who was a changuito when he was little. Now, I guess he's a changote. I don't know what they are when they grow up. Uh, but Kiki's had a fantastic career, and, uh, but his roots are firmly in theater. He started his career early 
early years with Ruiz Valdez and the Teatro Campesino. But I think his greatest accomplishment is marrying Bell Hernandez, and we may talk about that too. So zoom in Enrique Castillo, if you want to. <laughs> Maybe there you go. How are you? Loco. <laughs> <laughs> you look so handsome. You look so, you know, I'm so used to you on weeds playing these nasty guys, but you're a very handsome guy there. <laughs> you know, one of the fortunate, one of the fortunate things about playing characters like that, nobody bothers you. <laughs> That's probably true. You and uh, como, uh, Trejo, you and him, nobody goes near you, right? And there's Eddie. <laughs> And then there's Eddie. Well, you know, you're right, because Eddie is the sweetest, gentlest soul. Yeah. You know, he, he could be scary. <laughs> he could be scary. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me tonight. I, I salute you and your long career. Is Belle floating around there? Where's your beautiful Belle is wife? here, absolutely. Hello. There she is. <laughs> Everybody, Everybody loves Belle Hernandez. So I was, like I would everybody her loves Lucy. <laughs> that's true too that's that's true but anyway i want to okay, say a quick quote. all right my Thank greatest you. achievement it's true <laughs> of course everybody in hollywood knows bell hernandez who started our latino uh a variety latin heat entertainment back in the early 90s and she's uh she's just one of the dear dear people we all love her so you've done good you've done good but she did too <laughs> you know, we've known each other a long time, Kiki, but I had no idea yes. till I started doing research. I had no idea that you really got your start with a Teatro Campesino in the early years. I didn't know that. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, I met Luis at uh, UC Berkeley when I was a student there. You got, your, you, got your BA, you got your BA in performing arts there. Correct. And uh, he was teaching a class, which I took. And then uh, oh. we even started a, um, we started a teatro there called Hijos del Sol. Um, and we took productions around the university campuses and whatnot. And then he invited me down for the first Tenaz festival when they were moving the cup into San Juan, Bautista. Wow. Fantastic. I was going to ask you how, how you went from, uh, I know you were born and raised in Calexico, from Calexico to Berkeley to El Teatro, but you kind of right. just told me, wow, I love that. And you were there uh, on that historic uh, meeting uh, time when um, uh, Brooks, como se llama, the British Peter Brooke. director, Peter, Peter Brooks, Brooke. arrived yes, from I London with his theater company, including a very young Helen Mirren. Our darling right. Diane Rodriguez has told me stories. Tell us about that. That had to have been amazing. It was. The workshops were amazing and uh, uh, kind of free for all, rehearsing and uh, improvising. Uh, we, we, we did an improvisation that included them working in the fields with us and a strike would break out. And then we started uh, screaming out things about injustice and we want this and we want that. And all of a sudden, one of us screamed out and we want toilets in the fields. And everybody stopped and wondered, wait a minute, somebody asked, you don't have toilets in the fields? It was a revelation to them and I guess to everybody else too, but that's how I grew up working in the fields and we never had any of those conveniences. Even, you know, human dignity takes a wallop right there because you you have to either pile up, had to pile up a bunch of rocks to go behind or you found an irrigation ditch and that's men and women. So it was uh, it was a real revelation to them, but it was a lot of it was a lot of getting to know each other and uh, uh, trusting, you know, a lot of trust exercises and uh, trying to teach them Kalo, uh, <laughs> how to be bilingual. So it was a lot of fun. For them, it must have been like landing on another planet with another species because because your lives and theirs as, as you know as brits and i don't mean well i guess economically too but just as you say things that you grew up with to them must have been like you're kidding i i, I can't even imagine yeah you know al although peter's company was a multicultural multi-ethnic company he had actors from uh, africa actors from other parts of other countries and so they. Whoops, you froze on us. That's never happened. Hmm. 
I hope you can hear us, Kiki, because you're sorry for them. And certainly for Helen, of course. You know, we, we lost you there. You froze for a whole chunk of time. You couldn't see on the screen? Uh, no, actually, I did not. Yeah, you froze. Um, I don't know how far back we should go because I'm sure it was interesting. Uh, you were talking about the, the, the diversity in, 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 uh, in the Brooks company. They were from Correct. Africa and from everywhere. Can you pick that up again? Because we lost the whole thing. Yeah, well, they were from different countries, some of them underprivileged, but certainly Helen was not, you know, of an underprivileged um, uh, culture. So uh, for most of them, they had never, they had never experienced working with the much Chicanos, people who were bilingual like that, English and Spanish. A lot of, a lot of them obviously spoke English, but they'd never heard Caló, to be sure. So we had to go through the process of introducing them to the language. Well, no, Spanish is one thing and Caló is something else. There's a mixture, you know, and then you make up certain words and they began to get the, the rhythm of it. And then the whole idea of uh, struggling for equal rights. And they were very familiar with that, but in, it was an experience. In case uh, not everybody may know what Calo was. Do you want to tell them it's the Pachuco lingo? Yeah, I, I believe it's, well, it's, who knows how far back it dates, but it's, it's, uh, it's phrases that kind of have a double, sometimes double entendre, for example, uh, to eat. Vamos a comer, as you usually say that. But uh, uh, in Caló, you would say, vamos a machucar la muela. Or it literally translated would be, let's crush the molar. So, <laughs> yeah. And then you would say, vamos, vamos a tirar bonque, let's go to sleep. Or vamos a tirar playa, let's go take a shower. <laughs> not go to the beach but, but some, the things beach. Made, some things made no sense I remember my dad said they used to call Phoenix Phoenixe <laughs> I never knew why or what that meant then, there's one of my favorites which is uh, aliviana el esqueleto o techo, o techo andar la pompa o techo la pompa andar which means you better behave yourself or I'm going to kick your ass <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I remember when I did the document with my dad with Nancy de los Santos and, and there was Caló and one point I had to call Luis because we were we had to subtitle it and, 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 and the translation I'm like really? It was like oh man, oh, oh, man. Your, your, your dad was one of the kings of Caló brother <laughs> <laughs> miss right. him man miss him very very much yeah he was your he dad was, was very very special to all of us and you know the great thing um, you must know is that he was exactly what he appeared to be. That's who he really was. I mean, he was just this very pure, lovable. You, you could not love him. You know, it was. Oh, he's, yeah. He, he was like a big teddy bear to boot, man. <laughs> you know, when he when he was uh, the headliner, when I brought him in for that fundraiser, which he was so generous with his time, he showed up in his suit suit and he did. <laughs> And he, he just rocked everybody. The whole place was just on their feet and clapping. It was a very, very special night. And for him to do that, to go beyond, you know, the time that he, he was expected to do, extremely generous. And I love him and I miss him, Dan. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kiki. Thank you. So you, you love theater, you still do theater, we'll get to that in a minute, but ironically, uh, it was theater that kind of gave you your television debut when, when, uh, when Luis, when the teatro came and did uh, Vendidos, what, in 69, Los Vendidos, tell us about that. Yes, uh, they asked us to come and do what they called an ethnic special at NBC. I remember uh, and, that word, ethnic. Yeah, and it was uh, it was uh, Ana Sancho's used Mexican shop that we did as a centerpiece, and then we also did some other vignettes. Uh, and it was they they it, we had to go on the on the studio lot. You had to we're here for the ethnic special, and that they would let you drive in. Oh, God. Uh, but the centerpiece was Ana Sancho's used Mexican shop, and it was a guy who, it was Ana Sancho, and he had a bunch of Mexicans, stereotypical Mexicans in his shop, and he would sell them to, to different companies or whatever. And the whole idea was to 
eventually get them to buy me. And I was the Mexican American model that they had to melt down, you know, three Aztec princes and a this or that <laughs> to make me. And I was the bilingual one that was in a suit and tie and was very articulate and well-spoken. And so I'm the one that they would buy. And then I would plead with them not to let me go because I didn't want to go with that, that mendiga vieja, you know? But the whole idea was to get me to infiltrate into the Gabacho system oh <laughs> because God. everybody else that was supposed to be real, they were the robots. Everybody, and so Ana Sancho, actually Ana Sancho was the robot. And it was Luis playing uh, the, the, uh, the, the peasant character, the stereotypical one that leans against the cactus with a hat. Yeah. That was played by Luis. And he was the genius that created Ana Sancho to sell all of us to infiltrate into the system. And in that, uh, in that production for NBC, I was the one that was sold and it actually won an Emmy. I know that. Now that show would never be sold today. Probably not. Probably it's so not. Odd. Cause, cause if, I you, know if you would give it time in order to see the ending, it, it, would, it would fly. But with so many stereotypical characters in there, with a purpose, it just probably would, people would turn it off right away, you know? I'm saying nobody would green light a Chicano play for television or story. I mean, really today. It's, there very, that... it's very difficult to get anything green lit that is bilingual yeah. with Calo yeah. uh, because nobody will understand it. So oh. we will obviously, you know, but but if you're not Chicano and, and you're not, uh, you're not uh, familiar with street lingo, you're not gonna get it. Oh, we could do five hours on this subject, couldn't we? But let's move on. We'll get there, we'll get we, we, there, we'll get there. We've done all those panels. <laughs> we've done, how many panels have we sat on in this damn discussion? I don't wanna do it, no more, no more, you hear? Um, so you, you, you played Henry Reina in Zutu Tambien, and that brought you to L.A., which then kind of put you in the spot to then start your, your film and TV career. This was an amazing thing. You did it where? At the Aquarius? Where, where did you do it? Uh, no, at uh, the Mark Taper Forum. That was the first. Uh, that was yeah, when I... But I, I'm I, saying, don't you parent Henry Reina? Yes. Okay, so that was the Danny Valdez. So, so you replaced him when you were still at the tape when they were still at the taper. No, no, no. That was at the Aquarius. We moved there, uh, and I think a couple of months later is when Danny pulled out, and uh, then I took over as Henry. Ah, uh, uh huh. Is that's not where you met Belle? Was she still doing the show? Is that where you met? That that's where I met Belle. She she came in to replace a chorus line dancer. That was uh, because Alice Cooper's wife was in the show at that point. Alice oh Cooper, God. the rock musician. And she and this other lady, they were dancers with his show. And so Alice was gonna go on tour. So they pulled out and Belle came in to replace one of them. And then I was walking through the theater. It was dark on a Monday uh, through the house with Phil Esparza, who was one of the producers. Yeah. We yeah. walked onto the stage and when we walked behind the curtain, I heard some chatter and then I looked over and I saw these long, beautiful legs. <laughs> and that was it, man. Oh, I was mesmerized. I love that story. <laughs> but oh. that's not the first loving words I ever said to my future wife. We were during the performance. It was her first performance and we were supposed to cross diagonally upstage She's dancing downstage. Now keep in mind, she's with a rival gang, but now she's dancing toward us, rival gang members, with a big smile on her face. <laughs> and I said these loving words to her. I said, get out of my way, you F and F. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder she fell in love. <laughs> love at first insult. <laughs> wow. I love and of that course, story. of course, she was new to it. She she be, she understood later on that it was all in character. <laughs> and so from then on, it was coochie coochie and intermission. I don't need yes. any more details. I'm thrilled. 
And how many years now you guys married? Well, 37 together, but 42 wow. total. Wow. Married, 30, married 37, 42 together. See, there are happy Hollywood marriages. See, Absolutely. you can find happiness on the stage. Um, you've had this amazing TV. Uh, TV. <laughs> my son, by the way. You had this amazing my, film at TV. I was oh. saying my, my son met his wife in Zoot Suit. He got cast in the show in San Diego, and he met his wife, who was also a dancer. <laughs> wow. I saw that production. It was fantastic. Yeah. That was a wonder at San Diego Rep. What right was it? Yes. San Diego? That was a fantastic production. Yeah. And I think Luis's son directed, didn't he? I think yeah. so. I or was think it so. Reached? They had projections. I and I remember because I hadn't seen it since the original. And I remember right. thought, thinking, I wonder if it's going to hold up and blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, it's as it's you know relevant as ever, but it 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 was it was incredible. It was such a good production. Yeah. It's a it's a great story. It's really a great story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your TV and film career. I say a little bit because I know we do want to talk about the documentary that you're you're you're, you're in the middle of a crowdfunding campaign with it. But right. um, but we got a few little photos here, and and I'd love you to give us a little capsule. That of course is Blood In Blood Out, Taylor Hackford. That wasn't was that wasn't your first film, was it? No, no, that, that, that was quite a bit after. My first film was a film, a border film called Borderline with uh, uh, Charles Bronston. And uh, it was also Ed Harris's uh, first film also. Wow. Wow. So I was Ed Harris's partner in a smuggling ring. Um, and it was uh, quite a learning experience working uh, along with uh, Charlie Bronson. Oh my he was, uh, he was, you know, at that time, he was the biggest star in the world. And That's right. Do anything he wanted. And uh, he, he, I actually learned quite a bit about acting in front of a camera just by watching him. And then he, he took, there, somewhere in the middle of the film, he, he took a liking to me and uh, taught me some things about uh, stunt work and how to, how to work with the camera and doing stunt work. He, he choreographed the whole thing. The, we had a there's a scene where he beats me up and so he worked with me on it he taught me how to take the punches how to set up for camera so he was a very very giving guy on uh, off the off the set you know so people always think like you know like me and blood and blood out they think yeah. you're the guy like yeah. that but he's actually a very very nice guy and good sense of humor very generous very generous very, very generous yes but the photo from a uh, blood in a blood out. Why is that? Because that that film has become a cult favorite, and everybody knows that film, and everybody knows your character. Why do you think that struck a chord? Blood in, blood out, in particular. Well, I think the depth of the film has to do, and how, why it connects with people, uh, is because it has a very strong family roots element to it. It's also symbolized at the end of the movie by, you know, the tree, uh, which is a symbol of family. Mm -hmm. And we refer to loyalty and family throughout the film. Um, my character also uh, tries to explain to Miklo, the character, that he's headed in the wrong direction, not to follow in my footsteps, but to get himself out of, the, out of there by education. So those elements are, are, they resonate to the community because that's what we want out of our community is to, is education, better education. Family has always been very important in our culture and sticking together no matter what, helping each other. And, and then of course there is element that the, this is one of the very few films where you see uh, lead characters, Chicano lead characters that are driving the story. It's a story about them and they're the ones that are kicking butt and taking control and driving the story forward. So it resonates with our community in that respect. My character in particular, I have found 
that it really touches young women and many a young women who have grown up without a father figure. And so uh, I've had several young ladies that have come up to me very tearfully saying, you know, when they see my character, it reminds them of their father or the father they never had, the father that they lost. And so they see the film over and over and over. I mean, we're, th we're thankful that, that they do obviously, you know, because um, it, it has a, a long history with our community of empowering them and having them feel like, like somebody remembers them, somebody has paid attention to them. And in particular, a culture that has always been dismissed in Hollywood. Well, and, and as you say, all those are universal themes. They're all universal themes, family and, and, and uh, uh, caring about one another and, and, you know, different circumstances, God knows. But family, going from that family, which is one kind of family, Gregory Navas, film my family everybody let's see that photo uh oh I yeah swear, look at that cast i swear i'm the only latino in la that wasn't in that movie everybody you know, was in that movie keep, keep that. that photo up keep that photo up because this this is one of the pictures and one of the movies that i always refer to when i hear people say oh man you know latinos we they don't get along or we don't get along well, look at this, Ernesto Gomez Cruz, Mexicano, Lupe and I, Chicano, so is Constant, Eddie, and there's Jenny Gago, she's Venezolana, I think, or Colombiana, and there's, there's Elpidia Mexicana, Jimmy is Puerto Rican Dutch or something, Isa is in the movie, he's Puerto Rican, Maria Canales is Cuban, what do you mean we don't get along? <laughs> you I know, love that And there we are. I, and there we are as familia. And that is also the case in Selena and many of the projects that I've been involved in. Yeah. So whenever I hear that, I, I always say, hey, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because that happens in every culture. Not everybody gets along, but somehow it all, it's always, the finger always points to us that we as Latinos don't get along. And that could be the farthest thing from the truth, you know? Yeah, I, I love that photo. I, I, I love Jenny Gago. I haven't thought of her in years. I loved her. She was a lovely, lovely lady. I loved her. Yeah, and she's Niklo's mother in Blood In, Blood Out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> wow. I, I love that photo. I love that photo. And then, of course, Weeds. Oh, my God. How, long, how many years were oh, you in wow. Weeds? How many? I did three seasons three seasons and it was so enjoyable. I mean, you would think that we were on the stuff of the subject matter. <laughs> everybody, everybody from the crew to the cast, everybody was so supportive. Everybody loved their characters. Wow. Genji was outstanding. I mean, she was so supportive of everybody, very generous with her time and the writers on board were very collaborative with the actors. You know, I, they asked me, what do you think of the character? And I actually, I patterned my character after Pancho Villa's right-hand man, Rodolfo Fierro. And I had done a lot of research on Fierro and I compiled all that information because I'd always wanted to play that character. No, no project ever surfaced for it, but then I shared that information with the writers, one of the writers, and he just loved it. He took it and he said, oh, wow, you know, this is great stuff. I can see the parallel with your character. And thank you so much for sharing that. And I said, well, thank you for collaborating, for listening, you know, which isn't usually the case. No, I was going to say what you describe is so rare, you know, where everything is perfect. The, the script, the story, the cast, the, 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 the producers. How often does that happen? Not yeah. very often. Yeah, wow, how interesting, awesome. how wonderful, how wonderful. I love that, I love that. Okay, what am I, oh, I love this photo of you. We're really going back in time. Oh. <laughs> Where was that? Do you remember? This is the Waltons. I was probably right. the only Chicano ever on the Waltons. <laughs> and I played, uh, I believe his name was Eddie Ramirez, Sar Sergeant. Uh, and he was delivering a medal to uh, one of the ladies who had lost the husband. 
uh, I think Mary Judy Norton Taylor was the, the actress. She had lost the husband and uh, my character was delivering the medal. And he actually had, he was going through PTSD during the episode. And so he was, he had a very short fuse and uh, he broke some sailor's arm at the beginning of the show. And he got in a little trouble about it because he was versed in martial arts. And so um, uh, he, spent, he spent some time trying to endear himself to law enforcement and explain himself. And she took a liking to him and then kind of like ruffled his feathers and got him to count to 10 before he made a rash decision or anything dumb. And um, the producers on that show, they were, the, I never really met them except for the audition, but we would get word on the set that they were very, very pleased with the character and, uh, and my work in it. Um, I was lucky, you know, because just about everybody in Hollywood auditioned for the role and in the role, I mean, you've got to ride horses. You, I got to play guitar and sing um, in English and Spanish. So it, it was a very, very fulfilling role and an opportunity. A multifaceted character you could really get into. I mean, that's very yeah. rich, all the levels. Yeah, I wish I would have done a better job, but you know, you always say that. <laughs> you were young, you were young. <laughs> but while, while doing all of this amazing work on the screens, big and small, you always kept your theater chops. You always kept your theater chops. I'm just gonna do a couple of them, but you starred and directed in The Last Angry Brown Hat which toured extensively. You wrote and directed Veteranos, A Legacy of Valor, which honored right. our Latinos in the military, which God knows are always overlooked every damn time there's a movie. There was never any Latinos in the wars, any of them. Um, and you were one of the founding members of a Latino theater company, which is, I think, where we first met because we were, you were there and we, I was on the board with Gil Cedillo, our-, our Yes. Our, who, who, who's done so much for our people, our, our politico. City council yeah. member. Oh God, yeah, it was something. So you you kept your, your theater your theater chops. Um, yes. And I would love to go into all that, but we're gonna move on to the documentary you're doing right now that okay, you're working you know. on, okay? It okay. is called Los, Ch Los Changuitos Feos de Tucson. So, um, the title is act of the documentary is actually Ugly Little Monkeys. Exactly. Now let's talk about that. Uh, that's the translation if there's any gringos from North Dakota <laughs> zooming in. Uh, uh, let's talk about that name. You know, I, I, I have a long history with the Changuitos myself. I know them, I love them, uh, not the originals, but you know, <laughs> and uh, as did my dad, he sang at so many fundraisers yeah. and you know, very much so, but it never occurred to me until doing the research here, I'm thinking, now, wait a minute, Los Changuitos failed. That's not a very nice name. And if you think about it, some might consider it rather racist. I mean, the first president Bush got into big trouble for calling his grandchildren, the little brown ones. Yes. And now you're calling little brown children ugly monkeys? Yes. How, how, has that ever come up, I'm wondering? We should ask Stephen when he comes on. Well, uh, that was one of the more important questions that we had amongst you know, so many that we wanted to ask the members. What did uh, they say? And, and, as we, you, and we, have, we have actually contradictory positions within the members. Uh, some of them say that they hated the name, they didn't like it, they complained about it, uh, but they were told by Father Charles of Rourke, who started them, uh, well, that's the name that's, I chose it and it's, it's going to stay, so you're going to have to lear, learn to live with it. Wow. When we asked them, you know, decades later, how, how they feel about it, most of them didn't pay that much attention to it at the time. Uh, you're, some of them were nine years old, 10 years old, 11. The oldest were 17, really. Uh, so it was pretty much go along to get along with the name. Uh, some of the parents were 
questionable about the title, but again, it was, you know, the priest is the one who gave him the name. So sure. el padrecito dijo, sure, you know, so sure, they sure. go along with it. Uh, some of them have said that they consider it to have been good marketing because it was, oh, it was cute. You know, some said, oh, it was a cute name, you know, and we thought it was a good marketing tool. Um, so it is, it is today very controversial obviously it would be and the interesting thing is that the name is still there because the organization of los changuitos feos is still there in tucson over 52 years later exactly and still the goes brand. by it's, that it's, name it's a brand but but, but I found it so interesting that I had it never thought because I kept saying oh changuitos feos so it, it was just their name and it wasn't until I'm working on this that I suddenly thought wait a minute I I, I I it never occurred to me for what you're saying it's their name and you kind of say it and you're not even thinking about it but wow well you know one of them actually also said and even Linda in an interview says you know there's a lot of groups that are named after animals, the monkeys, you know, it was the monkeys. Yeah, but they weren't, they weren't the ugly monkeys. They were just <laughs> yeah. the plain old monkeys. We have a photo of you on uh, your, I guess you're interviewing you, uh, Abelardo. Is this, uh, you're interviewing some of the, because um, the Linda yes. you're talking about is Linda Ronstadt, of course, who was, who Correct. was in, who was in this it. here. We're interviewing, we're interviewing the group. We've got them all together in a uh, recording studio and interviewed them. And I believe this was the first time all of these gentlemen had been together. So I think you froze again. I wonder if Cap he's- is, we, we lost That is you. Wilfred Arvizu. We lost you, Mijo, completely. Picture and everything, you went away, but you're, you're back now. You're back now. Okay. The, we, um, we have the a picture that you saw is is uh, is in a in a recording studio, and we brought all of the most of the members back uh, at one time to interview them as a group, and it was the first time that they had been together like this to share their experiences with anyone on camera, and the gentleman that you see in the background in the black with a cap is Wilfred Arvisu. And he's the one that wrote the book that uh, drew my attention to it when my friend David Valdez sent it to me. And uh, Wilfred's brother had been in the group before him. And that's why Wilfred ended up uh, a little, an ugly little monkey too. <laughs> and the book title says quite a bit, by the way, and we'll get to it in a second. The, fil uh, the book is called, um, uh, Bless me, Father, for you have sinned. We'll get to get that in a second. We have a couple of photos of the original group, I guess, uh, the Changuitos, the original group. That's Father, that's Father Rourke with them. Uh, we go to the next, yeah, there they are. They yes. toured all over the country. They yes. toured all over the country. And, uh, and it was started in, as you say, in a church basement in the cathedral there by an Irish uh priest father charles rourke and um there is a photo uh that we're going to get to in a minute but before we do i'm trying to think here what should we do here before we move into a very serious topic within this story let's see the trailer because we have a short trailer which looks absolutely beautiful david valdez who is uh, a tucson guy has great roots and connections with the Changuitos, and he's a very well-respected cinematographer, and he's co-directing, and you can tell because it's so beautiful. It looks very rich. Can we see that? They were kids from the barrio, some musicians. Others had never picked up an instrument. He said, uh, Tiger, you're sharp. And I said, thank you, Father. <laughs> I didn't know the difference between sharp or flat. You know. Give him the quote. You can be cute for 30 seconds, but after that, you better be a damn good musician. It began in the basement of a church in Tucson, Arizona. Kids as young as nine studying under the musical direction of a popular Catholic priest. We would practice every Sunday, two, three, four hours, then five, and then six, and then seven. A 
prodigy. Father Roar came from a show background, and it was quite apparent. But he was also a very accomplished musician. And perfectionist. Play your violin parts with I've been kidded many times about the unusual paradox of an Irish priest from New York teaching Mexicans their own music. Linda, what are your earliest memories of the Changos? I think it was a party that my dad had at his house. I remember. It, you were good. <laughs> I was expecting Dorito music, but it wasn't. <laughs> Dorito music. <laughs> so I call it imitation music. People standing around in big hats singing the wrong music. Linda, we love our Linda. I think now's a good time to bring uh, Steve Carrillo on. Steve was a Changuito, not the original, was a Changuito along with his brother, Randy. And they uh, grew up and formed their own class A, Maria Cobre, the best, hey, the best. Yes. And there yes. he is. Hey, Steve, how are you? How are you, Dan? Kiki, how are you? Steve, I've, ne I've never see seen you again. out of mariachi drag, I don't think, have I? <laughs> I'm in regular civilian clothes, right? <laughs> I know. So um, we have a picture. I think we have a photo of you and, and uh, Randy, you know? Oh, yes. That was, uh, that was at Disneyland in California in 1969. Wow. And, and that picture, the previous picture you showed with Father Rourke, uh, Mac Reese, who's on the right holding the violin, that was him as a little kid. That's Mac standing next, oh. standing to my left. And I'm in the middle with a guitar, and that's my brother Randy with a guitar on. And that was in Disneyland. So, so it started in, in what year? The early, early mid 60s? When did it start? The actual Chang Changuitos started in 1964. And you joined it in 60? 60... 67. The that end was of pretty early on. The end that of was 67. pretty early on. Yeah. We have a picture of, of Rourke and a trio that to me is. <laughs> yeah, because uh, tell us, uh, how do we get into this? Okay, that's, that's Father Rourke, uh, right to Father Rourke's left. The very first person is Tony uh, Saldivar. And then in the middle is Pat Patricio Carrion. And on the very right is Mac Reese. Okay, but let's talk about Father Rourke. Okay. When you joined in, did, were people already talking about things that might be happening? This dark secret that you, you were going to deal with in the documentary? When, when I joined, Dan, I was nine years old. So that was a thing of, I think I was so young and so innocent or not, not aware of what was going on. No, was, you, would, you wouldn't be, but I'm saying that the parents, the adults, was there any clue of what might be going on? Not at all. Not at all. Not especially the parents, no. The parents Enrique, have, have you found any? What, what have you uncovered in that so far? Well, well Wilfred, Wil oh, damn, it froze again. Yeah. One incident that happened in Guadalajara. I'm sorry, we, the, we you froze again and we lost you. So can you start uh, from the beginning? Uh, when we interviewed, well, in the book, there is an incident. One, there's one incident in particular that Wilfred also uh, recounts in the documentary. And it was an incident in Guadalajara. And uh, it happened with the, the priest and a, and a young man. There were several of the members that had to intervene, including a chaperone. And then they, uh, they, he remembers coming back home in, and he and his brother, his brother in particular, informed the parents. Do not get up. Do not get up. I'll be there in five minutes. Did I freeze again? No, I'm sorry. I have a little incident here. I'm so sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, anyway, so so he recalls that uh, he and his brother got home after they came back from Guadalajara, and they um, they recounted the incident to the parents, but the parents ignored it. Uh, they didn't comment. They didn't, uh, the, as far as they knew, they didn't relay it to anybody else. Uh, and in fact, uh, the priest was at their home. Uh, a couple of weeks later, having dinner. 
Um, well, it's it's that it's such. And a there were and there were others that that do mention that parents were aware, board members were informed, uh, but there is a particular, I guess it's called a syndrome called uh, avoiding confirming suspicions that you know you kind of ignore it because you don't want that you don't want to have to deal with that so there's there's that element of um there's always been that element well did people know did people not know and the inquiries that we have made people did know that's the conclusion that we have come to it's just that they avoided telling anyone or sharing one family with another or whatever for for whatever reasons uh, it was you got to remember much, it was the time too much also. of them to believe that a priest could do that i'm quite sure they just they just shut it down there's just no way i i, I would imagine well if you re if anybody has seen the film spotlight or other documentaries like that it is it is exactly that is is your you're messing with, you know, your your insurance policy to the hereafter, um, and nobody wants to do that. And also, it's a it's a very well respected figure in our community, in many communities. Um, children sometimes uh, will make things up, so there's that element that of disbelief. It's like, well, you're just a kid, you know. Maybe you saw things wrong or whatever. So, and those in those times in particular, I mean. You know, it's very, very difficult to uh, for something like that and in our community to deal with uh, directly. So it's understandable why why it took Wilfred forty some years to write that book. So Steve, you you know, obviously I'm not saying that uh, was it worth it, but I'm saying how does one because because what came of it is beautiful. You know, the, the education and, and yet with this thing, how does all that work together in your head, having been a, a young uh, Shankit? Like I say, when I joined when I was nine, um, I, I was unaware of all that. I was aware. Oh, I understand that. I'm talking about looking back now. <clears throat> now? Um, well, it's just incredible that the, the organization is still going and that it is it is it has it has such high respect, high regard uh, in the mariachi community. They, they, they're, they're really great musicians now. They've really accomplished a lot in mariachi. And I think a lot of good came out of it. Just the, the discipline, the, the, the hard work that, and I, I mean, I go back when I think back now, um, it was because of the Changos and I remember Father Rourke instilling uh, the discipline, the practice, the the dedication. Um, I mean, because of because of the changos, I am who I am today. I'm a professional musician, a professional mariachi, and um, and I attribute all that to the changos. I was, I think, if I can say, I I was one of the fortunate ones who was not really affected. Uh, by Father Rourke in a negative way. Um, I did see many things as far as his alcoholism um, when we would travel. I saw a lot of things, but I was so young then that, that it just, it didn't enter my mind then. It was kind of like, oh, he's, he's drunk sure. again. And, and we just, it was just a common I, thing. I do, I do wanna, I do wanna add to what Steve is saying, uh, Dan, because uh, the, the episodes that happened with Father Rourke, everybody understands and everybody does give credit to Father Rourke for starting Los Changuitos Fils de Tucson. That is beyond argument. So when Father Rourke started this thing, it wasn't very long after that he began to fade from the picture because these young boys were the ones that had to take over because Father Rourke was missing from the performances a lot of times due to his alcoholism. And so, 
you've got 10, 11 year old kids up to 17 who are basically their own chaperones, their own support system, their own counselors, their own banking system because they had to be doing everything on their own. However, but let me, however, let me back up. Let me back up and say, you said the episode. Surely it didn't just happen once what the priest was allegedly doing to young boys. An episode happened once? No. I, I would no. think not. There, there were others that have been, there have been recounted and they reveal in the documentary. Uh, and also the, the grooming process by the priest, but also how these young kids took care of each other, looked out for each other, counseled each other. And so the documentary does expose that part of Father Rourke, but it is a small part of the entire documentary because we do give credit to Father Rourke for doing what he did, but he's not the one that we feel deserves most of the credit. That, that's a good point, uh, what, what Kiki's saying, Dan. Because he wasn't around. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Well, what Kiki's saying, and like I can share an experience, <clears throat> I was probably 10 years old. I think this was either yeah, 1968-ish in that area. We all, we flew to Louisville, Kentucky for the Kentucky State Fair. Father Rourke, and there were probably 12 of us. And just like Kiki said, Father Rourke went on one of his binges of, of drinking. He disappeared. Um, wow. He disappeared. But, but there no, no other chaperones? It was just... No other chaperones. And we were all on our own. And, I, and that's like Kiki said, the older guys stepped up. David Reese, my brother Randy, Mac. Um, the, the older guys... And I remember them calling David Valdez's dad, who was who was a, a board member at that time. Uh, they called him to say, "Hey, Father Rourke disappeared. Um, we're all on our own here." And and that's when I I remember about a couple hours later at our hotel, they had like three or four uh, Kentucky State Trooper cars just sitting outside of our hotel room, just. Um, taking care of us and whenever we needed to go gig at the Kentucky State Fair we were there I can't remember probably four or five days um, they would just take us we were on our own Father Rourke wasn't even there and that's what what Kiki's saying is that you know you got to give credit to the, those guys that they kept going we kept going this group kept going and and Partly, probably because of the discipline that Father Rourke instilled in us, um, the hard work, the practice, the, the dedication, and uh, it kicked in when Father Rourke abandoned us. And I, I understand yeah, that. And, I understand that, and that's that, the point. But, but it sounds like he's getting a pass. To make he can't get a pass because of it. And I don't mean that. No, he doesn't, get, do he, that. Can, he doesn't get a pass. And, and really, the, 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 the essence of the project is to say these, this mariachi music on a global level is what it is today, not because of Father Rourke, in spite of Father Rourke, okay. because it was these guys that gave us the popularity of mariachi music to where it is today. And it was also not just the original members, it was the parents. The parents would have all kinds of events to raise money for them. Yeah. They had to deal with the priest also calling him to task, you know, getting in his face. And so, you know, it's that element where you wish the situation wasn't what it became, but it took an entire community to get mariachi music where it is today. And also, hey, your father writing, you know, mariachi music, you know, it, it, it instilled in these young men a sense of community pride at a time and cultural pride at a time when they were at such a vulnerable age because the 
the British invasion was happening and all kinds of rock music was going around. They could have gone easily like to the, the become Beach Boys or what have you, you know? But because that element was introduced in their lives and it was supported by the parents. Yes, you know, I love the music. The parents would listen to mariachi music. Maybe these kids, many of them didn't. But when they took it up, look at Steve now. He is a, I mean, you cannot compare very many mariachi groups to mariachi cobra. Even- That's the truth, Ruben Fuentes, that is the truth. From, even Ruben Fuentes from Mariachi Vargas de Tecalitlan gives credit to the Changuitos Fields of Tucson for the rise in popularity of Mariachi Vargas in the US. That is saying something. Whatever happened to the priest? Obviously, he was never, it never dealt with that at all. What did he pass away before anything? Could, what happened to him? Uh, well, I don't know if we should reveal, you know, like, like bury the. Oh, no, here. wait, <laughs> no, let, let's see. Let, okay, so let, let's, let's tell people how to donate for this wonderful documentary. We have a beautiful, your poster is gorgeous. Let's see the poster. We have the website, it's uglylittlemonkeys.com. And there is a donate button on there, on the, on the front page. And uh, it has uh, the, the, uh, the team on, is on there. So you can learn all about us and who's putting this together. And then there are biographies and photos of uh, many of the original members. And you can read about them and what they did post their experience with the Changos because those are also elements to the documentary that we want to reveal. Because once, the, you, once you graduated from high school, you were gone from the Changos and what were you gonna do then? And so a lot of them became world-class musicians, a la Stilka and Randy Carrillo and Mac Ruiz. Correct. Gilbert Vélez. Gilbert Vélez became what the 10th Don in Kenpo Karate. And Jerry Gay became an astrophysicist and worked on launching the Hubble telescope. These are amazing, amazing individuals. And to me, the most impressive part is that they teach mariachi or education through mariachi. That is part of their legacy, success through mariachi music, education. And I've seen Steve in action. We followed him to Dallas, Texas to work with students there and let me tell you, you cannot, you cannot take away the legacy of Los Changuitos Fields when it comes to mariachi and education coupled with it. It, it is so impressive to watch these guys work with students. It, it's it, my hats off to them for doing that, for making mariachi an educational component in universities and high schools and it started school. that whole movement it started, it that, started whole movement that whole throughout movement throughout the southwest yeah it started the, like kiki said it start it started the mariachi movement uh, in uh, in the united states especially the youth mariachi movement and and like I, I hats off to to the organizations throughout the history of the changos back when father rourke left we we were on our own for a few years um then Father Butler came in, and then after Father Butler left, uh, Mr. Mendoza took over, Betty Villegas took over. I mean, all the way up to the current Changos right now, who is still keeping it going and still still have that drive of, of like Kiki says, the, the education. Um, that, that, that's, I, my hat's off to them because that's a great, uh, it's a great legacy. And 57 years strong so yeah. you know part part of that legacy also includes i mean the educational component and then what do you do after well you know jose cruz gonzalez wrote american mariachi and my son has done a couple of productions including the one in tucson and american mariachi they have four guys that are actual mariachis in the show that play the music and they're ch former changos Oh. So they're doing theater. <laughs> I, I love that. Look, look at this, uh, Steve. Can you see this? Oh, that's the well, that's the fiftieth. 
Yeah. yeah. Linda Ronstadt and I were um, co-chairs or something. And, and you did that incredible arrangement of, of Barrio Viejo. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Remember? Right. Yeah. That was fantastic. Kiki, how far along? We're going to wrap this and get to some Q&A, but, but how, okay. how far along are you in, in the docu? How much of it is done? And what is it you're still trying to raise? Well, we're, we're more than halfway done with the documentary. We have interviews in a can, uh, Linda, of course, and we brought Eddie on board as executive producer, Edward James Olmos. He's, uh, you know, we're fortunate that he's come on board. He loves the project. Um, and then uh, we are trying to get our hands on Carlos Santana because he has a mariachi background. We are trying to get our hands on uh, George Strait who recorded with mariachis, he recorded El Rey, he's even done it live. Um, so we're trying to, we're, we still have uh, some traveling to do to film some of these guys in their elements. We went to, uh, to uh, Orlando and we filmed Steve and uh, the um, uh, mariachi cobre there. And uh, in their homes, we interviewed Mac uh, and then we want to travel to North, is it North Carolina where, where Randy is now, Steve? Yeah, South, South Carolina, yeah. South Carolina. And then we want to travel to Washington State because uh, David Ruiz is, David. is a doctor of medicine. And we want to go film him at his practice up there. And then, of course, we, we'd love to do more with Linda. And, uh, um, and then just... Steve is- so You need Steve. more money. You need more money is what we're talking we about. We need more money. And All right, and, so let's get some money. Steve, do you have any parting words you want before we go to the Q&A? Well, I'd like to say that, that this documentary, what I've seen of it, I mean, it, it's very positive. It's, it shows the good that the Changos have done and that the good that they are still doing. Uh, thanks to Perfect. the past board, past, pre, uh, past parents, uh, to the present now. And it's a positive thing. And it's really beautiful to see that this still going after 57 years. Perfect, perfect, perfectly said, perfectly said. Abelardo, do we have some uh, Q and A, some little questions? We have a, a couple of questions here, but a lot of uh, really incredible, just uh, greetings out to, to uh, Enrique and also to Steve, uh, people watching from you know, Montebello from Hacienda Heights. Uh, a question here uh, from David Oliveira. Um, he met, I met uh, Jimmy Santiago Baca in 89 in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, before he wrote the screenplay for and a cast member for Blood In, Blood Out, I'd like to know if Enrique still keeps in contact with Jimmy Santiago Baca. Occasionally, yes, we've seen each other. Um, we met at a book festival. He was reading some poetry. Uh, we're Facebook friends, so we contact each other that way. Saw him at the reunion. No, well, he wasn't at the reunion. Jimmy wasn't. But uh, yeah, we, we talk and, uh, we, and we've often tried to answer a lot of people's questions, which is at the forefront is, where's the sequel? <laughs> <laughs> so so th that's the question, where's the sequel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have uh, from Peter Anderson. Is there an active effort to preserve the Kalo language for future generations uh, and, and movies? Uh, there is a dictionary uh, called uh, El Libro de Kalo. And ironically, it was compiled by two guys from my hometown of Calexico. <laughs> All right, so I guess there is. Uh, not no more questions here, but we have Roberta Martinez talking about the, the changuitos. They are brilliant musicians. We have uh, uh, Nancy de los Santos, a big fan of Enrique, and we're big fans of, uh, of Nancy. Uh, yes. Yes, David Oliveira uh, coming in, zooming in from the, uh, from Seattle, Washington. So maybe he could uh, he could uh, give you some room and board there when you're filming uh, the the doctor there. Uh, let's, Esther. Let's... Go ahead. Go ahead. I would say let let's let's one more time tell people how to donate. Just the website, um, Kiki. The website is uglylittlemonkeys.com. Yes, we have it. Uglylittlemonkeys.com. Uh, <laughs> that's not it, right and there. And we need to reach. Is. 
this camp this campaign is uh, we're raising fifty thousand dollars and uh, we were we were really touched by one lady who really couldn't afford to send but she sent an, a car to our to our co-director david and uh, she sent three dollars and we were very very oh, touched because that's as you know, important as a thousand that's as important oh my gosh as a you know, yes it's so so heart-wrenching to know that people are you know, digging into their pockets or their little yes. calcetines, man, and coming up with stuff. Yes, and, yes, yes. Hey, Dan, wow. yes, just on, a, on a personal note, I remember when I was in the Changos, when I was a little kid and we would play events where your dad was. And I remember, <laughs> I remember that. And now that I'm in Cobre, I remember that Cobre actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we played your dad's last public appearance. That's correct. That's right correct. in Tucson. In Tucson, in and Tucson. you know what? You know what function that was? The 40th anniversary of the Changuitos. Exactly. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And there's an amazing photo. I I think Betty Viega sent it to me, of Dad. And I wish I remember the photographer. It's literally his last bow, literally, and wow. his arms are outstretched and his face is up, and he looks like he's in church. It's this beautiful, it's literally his last bow. He died like four months yeah. later. Uh, yeah, I, re I remember that concert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he was very tired. Uh, I remember that. And I was exhausted taking him around by that time too. <laughs> he was, a oh God, that boy. Anyway, um, thank you both so much. This has been fantastic, Kiki. I love you. We have a history. I love Bill. Thank you, man. Give her a hug for me. And um, let's 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 get this documentary done. It's very important. And Tucson, come on, the, the old Pueblo, they'll support this. Thank you all very very much. Thank you, thank we'll you, you Steve. Take care, buddy. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Enrique. Thank you, Steve. And as, as as always, Dan. Thank you so much for hosting these wonderful happy hours. Uh, this is about the I guess the thirtieth one we've done since we began back in, in uh, April or May. I'm uh, posting right uh, the playlist because you could catch this uh, uh, session of En Casa con la Plaza Dan Guerrero Happy Hour on our YouTube channel at La Plaza LA. You could also check it out at our Facebook page at La Plaza LA and we archive them all on our website, lapca.org. Um, I don't know what, what, what's in store for next week. Well, I do know what's in store for next week. We're in Casa Con La Plaza is taking the week off. Uh, and your servidor here, Avelar de la Pena Jr., is taking a week off. So no in Casas, but you could go to our website, our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page to check out all of our sessions, our presentations, conversations, demonstrations, and performances. I think you'll find something that you'll enjoy uh, by checking out En Casa Con La Plaza uh, that we bring to you almost every week. Um, however, next week on Saturday, uh, we have uh, reopened La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, uh, our museum, and we've also started our public programming. And, uh, and I'll show you a screen here of what's next. Uh, next Saturday, presenting uh, Selena Fest. It's an outdoor celebration and film screening next Saturday. Doors open at six o'clock. It's free of charge. West, wear your best Selena inspired look. We have vendors, food, and beverages. A Selena cover band, Seleamos. And that's sponsored by AARP, brought to you by La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And as Enrique said, he's in Selena, so you'll have to check him out and see what part he plays. Because uh, I saw it a couple of weeks ago, but I really don't remember seeing, seeing Enrique, but I'm sure he played a memorable part. Uh, Chris Morales, thank you. He says, we love these happy hours. Uh, Esther Hendershot, a, a big heart. You're going to be our guest pretty soon. Carlo Perez, Alan, muchas gracias, Dan and Enrique y Steve. Uh, Tina Huerta, it's a beautiful event. Uh, you know, we really enjoy having fun on these in Casa con la Plaza. And, uh, and Stephen, thank you for hanging around here. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you again to uh, our sponsor for the night, One Legacy. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving lives through organ, eye, and tissue donations. Enjoy the week off. You can check out our website and find out all that's going on at La Plaza. There's a lot tomorrow. In, casa, in Familia con la Plaza, that's our family workshops. We host every Saturday at 10.30. We premiere it on our YouTube site. 
Uh, and tomorrow it'll be, let's see, I think we're talking about uh, bachata, dancing. It's it's a wonderful program. It's En Casa Con Familia Con Uno, Dos, Tres, Andres, a Grammy Award winning children's entertainers. So uh, check it out on our YouTube page. Tomorrow we'll also be posting it on Facebook and uh, on, our, on our website. So thank you all for joining us. Muy buenas noches. Adios, Steve. Thanks for hanging out. And I did hear Mariachi Cobre. Uh, a few years back, I think, uh, on a travel down to San Antonio, and you guys are magnificent. Thank and, you. Uh, all right. Thank you for joining us, and we'll you. see you all out there real soon. Bye-bye. Gracias. Buenas noches.